We sit down with experts who are tackling some of the most pressing health issues, from the opioid crisis to hospital closures, food deserts to human trafficking. These are the problems that impact us all. Find out how Texas A&M is contributing solutions. You're listening to The Vantage Point on Texas A&M Health Talk. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Vantage Point. I'm Lindsay Hendricks. As the stigma surrounding mental health is starting to decrease, we're recognizing more and more that access to mental health care is not where it needs to be. I'm sitting down with Dr. Carly McCord, who's a licensed psychologist and the director of the Telebehavioral Health Program here at Texas A&M. Welcome, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. We are facing a shortage of mental health care professionals especially here in Texas. Can you set up what the problem is? How bad is it? Sure, so Texas has the most number of people living in mental health professional shortage areas. So we have over 10 million Texans living in these areas. And I think about across the country, I think there's only 10 states or so that even have 10 million people in them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a lot of people that are going underserved. For psychology, two thirds of our licensed psychologists operate in five of our largest counties. So that remains the re- leaves the remainder of the 254 counties clamoring for the last one third of the psychologists. So there's lots of counties that have zero psychologists and zero psychiatrists available to them. So is that an issue of there's just not enough trained psychologists and mental health care professionals or is it that they're just not going to the underserved areas to work? Probably a little bit of both but a lot of them not going to those areas to work. So with a a health professional wants to have a full caseload of of people to help and so when you're in these low population areas sometimes there's not a huge business case for being in a rural area and it also you know it sets up a scenario where you're the only provider in that area so uh, burnout rates can be higher because you don't have anybody to refer to everything that walks in the door you have some sort of responsibility to figure out if you're competent to help that person um, if you're going to send them to a specialist and for us this happens all the time at the clinic uh, that we have folks that come in with a concern And we know that there's specialty care. Uh, For example, a borderline personality disorder diagnosis, the the evidence would say that the best treatment is dialectical behavior therapy. And there's very few places around Texas that provide that service. So I could say, hey, this is, we've we've done a full assessment. This is what's going on. Your best case treatment option um, is this, and this is where it is. And it's probably from here, it's it's in Houston. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's two hours away. And so if I say I can't help you and this is your referral source, then really I've just turned that person away to no one. They're going to continue to go without services. And so we spend a lot of time talking about and consulting of um, what are the elements of that presenting concern that we can help with. Um, and there are often um, things like emotional regulation that we can help with. So we present that to them. We say, here's your best case scenario. This is where it is. Here's you know what else we're understanding is going on. And this is what we can do informed consent, which, what do you want to do? So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's hard when there's no referral sources. Um, so, and that increases your ethical risk. So there's just a lot of compounding reasons mm-hmm. why I think providers are hesitant often to work in rural areas. That can be very hard, so. And if there's 10 million people that are going without access to a mental health care professional, how many of those people will in their lifetime need access to a mental health care professional? So one in four individuals in their lifetime will um, experience a mental illness. Some folks don't even feel like you need to have a mental illness diagnosis necessarily to want to see or benefit from seeing a counselor, um, but, but certainly the one in four. And the average, I think, is 10 years before people are able to obtain care when they need it. So you've, people will be living 10 years with some sort of mental illness and it'll take that long to get the care that they need or it'll take that long for them to recognize that they need the care? Probably a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's compounded um, when you've got time and distance. Mm -hmm. Do do these, a lot of these illnesses start to exacerbate over time? Absolutely, they can. What are some examples of that? 
So some mental illness is episodic, so it happens in cycles. And so people experience depression for a period of time, and then, um, you know, it, it may resolve over time with additional supports and resources or changes that they make. Um, and so they think that um, all is well, and maybe it is well, and then it's not. Um, and, and for some of your more serious diagnoses, like bipolar disorder, I mean, untreated psychosis, hearing and seeing things that aren't there, um, untreated mania, just that, you know, feeling like you have limitless energy can have really poor effects um, when they're left untreated. What are the societal impacts? What are the impacts on productivity, happiness, all of the things that go into a society if we have people who are not treated for their mental illness? Oh, that's a good question. Poor mental health affects uh, all facets of an individual's life. It affects their work life and their work productivity and absenteeism. It affects the family life. Um, when those things aren't treated, um, there's a ripple effect out to all of the areas of someone's life. Um, and in areas where you lack access to mental health care, um, often people will wait until they're in crisis, so until they're having thoughts of taking their life, and then they mm -hmm. present to an emergency room. Um, and so from a systems perspective, when, um, you know, you would hope folks would route through their primary care provider, through their mental health professional, um, and when those aren't available, then they present to a level of care um, that, had they been seen sooner, would be unnecessary. So in the ER visits, are really costly. Uh, they're about $1,000 a piece. Um, the literature would say that about 68% of ER visits for mental health end in a psychiatric hospitalization um, to the tune of about $23,000 a piece. Mm. So, um, you know, Texas also has one of the highest um, uninsured populations. And so mm -hmm. when you think about the effects of where people are routing for care when they can't access um, the you know these lower levels of mental health care that they need um, it puts a huge strain on the system and I would imagine too that if people aren't accessing the healthy care that they may be deferring to alcohol or drugs or some sort of self-medication yeah I that? think that's common I mean everybody we are created to um, cope and to try and thrive and so sometimes um, things are negative coping that uh, end up having negative effects in the immediate term they make someone feel better and so if it wasn't helpful they wouldn't do it right mm -hmm. and so um, absolutely people turn to uh, less optimal choices when their right care isn't available. And so what is Texas A&M doing to help address the mental health professional shortage? here in this state. Sure, so we see telehealth as a really great solution to bridge um, and bring access to care to places that don't have it. So here in the Brazos Valley, we, all of the counties are designated as mental health professional shortage areas. And our School of Public Health has been doing uh, community assessments of our region for a long time. Um, and that data has shown us the lack of access to mental health, um, lack of access to transportation, and through that we, we thought, well, what other resources do we have here at the university? And so the School of Public Health reached out to the College of Education uh, to um, say, what do you think about having doctoral students, doctoral psychology students, be able to provide mental health care out to these rural areas? And so 11 years ago now, no, 10 years ago now, um, we obtained our first uh, HRSA grant that allowed us to pilot test telehealth out to Leon County uh, with the support of local leaders and the local government. And the model was successful. And then the next county over said, can we do telehealth here? And uh, we wrote another grant and um, launched another access point. And then through the Texas Medicaid 1115 waiver, uh, divided the state into regions and said, hey, come up with local solutions for your health problems. So it was a really great fit for us to say, point out again, we have these mental health access problems and we have a, a program that works. And so we added three more sites through the Texas Medicaid waiver program. And then this last September, I 
got a, another grant and have, are, I'm adding five more access points in three more counties. So, and all of that has been done with collaboration across a lot of colleges. Um, all of the health science center colleges have been a part of that. Um, mm-hmm. College of Education and the School of Public Health. And so it's primarily been our doctoral students in psychology that are providing those services. But going forward, we really have a tried and true method. Um, and so we will be creating a team of mental health professionals uh, that we'd like to bring services across Texas to areas in need via telehealth. So describe the telehealth system. What does it look like? How does it work? So telehealth just means health at a distance. So um, it usually implies the use of technology. So it could be uh, video conference. It could be audio only. Uh, Telehealth really also encompasses a lot of the remote patient monitoring. Um, I think that that has a place in addressing mental health needs as well. But um, so for us, we use a video conferencing platform that's HIPAA compliant and secure. Um, It's available from any mobile device and it's pretty easy to use so folks can enter their name and their password and log in complete any paperwork and meet with their therapist and it's all done virtually we don't have patients or clients that walk into the clinic they're all coming um, either to so we have both a hub and spoke model and an in-home model Um, so for the hub and spoke model We've partnered with community sites. Some, some are in primary care settings, but some are not in healthcare settings. They're in these resource centers. That's another uh, great um, program that the School of Public Health has started for our region. And so the client walks into that location and there's a computer with a webcam and a microphone. And they sit down in front of it and meet with their therapist. Um, and we realized over time the same reasons why uh, people couldn't get to Texas A&M, Bryan College Station, um, which is, you know, an hour, hour and a half for a lot of these folks, is the mm-hmm. same reason why they can't get five or ten minutes down the mm-hmm. road. Uh, they don't have a car. They don't have money to put gas in their car. They don't have child care. Um, their right. physical health is so poor they can't leave the home. Their mental health condition is something that keeps them relatively homebound. And so uh, we, we started doing some phone therapy as well, audio only. Uh, The research supports that both video therapy and audio therapy are equally as effective as in-person therapy. And so we started doing audio only when it was clinically appropriate just to help keep continuity between appointment times. And so over the last 10 years, as technology has picked up and more options are available, we were able to secure a platform where, um, in theory, folks can connect from their mobile devices from their homes um, for video sessions now. Uh, Rural broadband is still a Mm -hmm. real issue. So um, we'll begin pilot testing our in-home video, probably here in Brazos County where the um, internet connectivity is a little bit better. So with your um, audio counseling, is that done through a landline? Can people call from their home? They can call from their home. They can call from their cell phone. We have folks that take their lunch break and sit in their car (laughs) and meet with their therapist. Um, Yeah. So time, distance, money, these shouldn't be issues that are preventing people from getting the Absolutely. care that they need. Because the, the, the treatments that we give are all of the same evidence-based treatments. It's talk therapy. And so it translates over whatever medium you're using. Um, you know, there's some special considerations to practice and to think about. And so that's um, one of the things that I love about our training program and the psychologists that we're equipping is they're leaving thinking like telepsychologists. They think about for this particular person at this particular time um, with these concerns, what types of services are appropriate and not appropriate and really keeping in mind access um, and continuity of care um, and and pushing the envelope a little bit and just trying to get services to people. Is telebehavioral health care appropriate for all cases, most cases? How often does it work or is it appropriate? I w- that's a great question. I would say most cases. Um, most anything that's appropriate for outpatient mental health care generally is appropriate for telehealth. Um, Our number one exclusionary criteria would be people who self-select that that's not really what they want. So when we tell them it's a telehealth clinic, then they don't want to do it. Um, I think it dictates a little bit of the setting. So there's um, clinical reasons why in-home telehealth might not be 
um, folks who um, have tendencies towards self-harm, they have access often to means to hurt themselves in the home um, that they could bring to a clinic, but don't typically bring with them to right. a clinic. Um, and then there's presenting concerns where um, we want them to get out of the house. So we want them to come to a spoke. So someone with uh, major depressive disorder that we behavioral activation is a key part of their treatment plan then we want them to come to the clinic for their session um, we've had some really cool cases with agoraphobia which is fear of um, open spaces or fear of leaving the house um, a lot of times those individuals will go without treatment because um, they don't want to get out and see the provider and so we typically um, um, we can see that we can build a hierarchy of okay eventually obviously part of the goal should be for you to leave your house Mm -hmm. Um, but if you can't leave now then we build an exposure hierarchy for their anxiety so that the end result is that they are getting out weekly for their sessions that's fantastic do you have a specific case that you'd like to share a success story Related to agoraphobia or well, just related to this any program, case? telebehavioral health care? Oh, it's so hard to pick. I do this because of all the miracles that we get to see of um, people who were out of work and their relationships were um, falling apart and their mental health was poor and they felt like they had no reason to live. And in fact, 42% of the people that seek our services have thoughts of suicide mm-hmm. upon intake. But, um, and then I think part of the magic of working with people who haven't had services before is all of a sudden they get in, they, they get the evidence-based treatment, they get the help that they need, and, and pretty rapidly you see these drastic changes, um, you know, um, and their and their lives come back online and they they find a reason to live again and they get plugged back in at work or volunteering in their community and their relationships get better and um it's just it's really amazing to see um just how lives and families are changed when people have access to care what are some of the signs that people should look for um when do you come to realize that you should seek help for a mental health issue yeah i think functioning is probably one of the most critical things to think about so in our dsm it's our um, manual that describes all the different diagnoses and what you need every single one of them has the same criteria that it has to significantly impair functioning Um, and so if you feel like you're experiencing um, you know some anxiety or depression or some other uh, symptom that is getting in your way of um, work or family or um, yeah, getting in the way of your functioning, then mm-hmm. that's a good time to seek treatment. And all too often people wait until they have thoughts of suicide as um, the alarm bell that says, hey, you should get some help. You started the show off saying that stigma is decreasing for mental health, and I think that it is, and I think that we have room to grow there too, but I hope that people will Um, start to not wait until they're in crisis and realize that even as you notice uh, impacts on your daily life that people know it's okay to seek treatment. Relieve some of the fears that might be surrounding getting help. People fear judgment, perhaps from the people that are close to them, their family members, people who see them Mm -hmm. getting treatment, but sometimes people are fearful that the provider themselves Mm -hmm. will cast judgment on them should they fear that no i we we spend a lot of time in our training um to provide a non-judgmental uh accepting environment um our field has moved a lot in the direction of multicultural competence and um, embracing and working well with diversity um you know therapists just like a doctor um just like a banker we're all people um and so sometimes you don't click with someone i think if you do have a negative experience um to i you know identify that 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 may be more about that person than it is about uh psychology or about therapy Mm -hmm. um that that should not be the norm and so if you do have a negative experience it's okay to not go back and it's okay to look for someone else That's great. 
How much can clients expect to pay for the services that you provide? So for the services that we're providing in the Brazos Valley, we've been able to secure alternative funding sources that have provided these services for free to the individuals in the Brazos Valley. So, and then we have solutions to be able to partner with, um, again, wanting to go across Texas, we can, we can partner with clinics, we can partner with schools um, and um, f- find ways that um, generally the idea would be that those entities are paying for the services to make it available um, so folks may have to use their insurance or um, things like that as we grow and expand. Does Do a lot of insurance carriers pay for mental health services? It varies. It varies widely. And there's some different um, reimbursement policies for telehealth as well. Um, you know, in some cases, you have to be in a designated rural area. So you could be in an urban area and be underserved or need to meet with this um, specialty provider. Um, and if they're seeing you via telehealth, then it wouldn't be reimbursed. But um, there are... Yes, it just it it really varies. Um, that's something that we've dealt with at the clinic. Um, we primarily set out to serve uninsured, and then as people started telling their stories, as we did the uh, phone intakes, we would hear a lot about underinsured. Of hey, I did call, and I only have four sessions, um, and I've used my four sessions, or um, you know, my copay is more than I can afford, and uh, things like that. So, how long do should people expect to? continue their mental health care? Is it you go, you get the prescription, you leave, or is it a drawn out process? How long does it take? It depends. So we do have great medication options. Um, Sometimes that's all people need, and that's something that they can obtain from their primary care doctor often. Uh, When it comes to therapy, that depends on the presenting concern, depends on the therapist uh, orientation. Some therapists are very short-term solution focus therapists and that's what they do and they want to do it quickly and give you tools and get you going um, and then other therapies take longer so that those are good uh, questions to ask of a therapist if you're wanting to engage in mental health um, treatment is to be an informed consumer about you know what what do you think's going on what's the assessment how long is this process going to take um, the average number of sessions at our clinic is nine Uh, Some of our outcomes research has shown that the average time to clinically significant change uh, was 12 sessions. So I think on average, three to four months is a good um, expectation. Okay, great. And you talked about different counseling styles, different approaches to mental health care. Should people shop around? Should they try different therapists? Should you... Of like like getting a pair of shoes, right? Is that how Buying it works? That yeah. That is totally an opinion question. So I'm sure that there will be folks out there that differ um, in opinion. But I, I would give it at least two tries mm-hmm. with any one person unless you have a really uh, negative experience because um, counseling is just hard in general. And so trying to sort out for yourself. Um, and sometimes it's like an awkward dance with your therapist that um, the date. first session, yeah, first date <laughs> feels really awkward. You go back for a second time, you're like, oh, okay, actually, I'm kind of clicking with this person. Um, but I do um, recommend finding something that, that fits. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, obviously our primary concern is providing care for people in rural rural and outlying areas, Mm -hmm. but that there are underserved people in urban areas as well. Can you get into that a little bit? Gosh, I mean, sometimes it's just the the traffic and the distance. You know, you may have some kind of density of providers that they don't reach that designation status, but what an individual's experience is living in that city, it may be impossible to get to the other side of town. Um, Mental health shortage um, anytime that I've talked with folks that are working in urban areas, they have those same kind of strains. They just look a little different. And then you mentioned even your mental health state could keep you homebound, so sure. you're not even comfortable walking the five minutes down the road sure. if you have a provider down sure. the street, right? Yeah. What are some questions that you can ask your therapist about their style? Typically, that's referred to as a theoretical orientation. I mean, it, you can really just probably ask them about how does therapy work with you 
what can I expect? Do we meet weekly? Um, you know, just ask them directly, like, what's your style and approach? And so a therapist should be able to tell you what their approach is. So if someone asked me that question, um, I would say um, the, the core of my orientation is person-centered, uh, which believes that all people were created for growth and healing and change and that given the right conditions, um, which is the unconditional positive regard and um, acceptance, that um, often we can find our own solutions. And so I like to partner with people to help remove obstacles in their way to change. Um, so that's kind of the foundation of what I do. And then there are um, our science of psychology tells us a lot about specific treatments that are helpful for specific presenting concerns. So I might dive into if they're saying they came in for depression that um, we'll probably use some cognitive behavioral techniques. And that looks like that your thoughts are connected to your feelings. And so we'll dig in and start looking at your thoughts and and what kind of stinking thinking you might have and Mm -hmm. um, how can we can make some adjustments and on the flip side of that what are some questions that you can ask your primary care provider if you're feeling like you ought to seek some mental health care I think just bringing honesty and and telling them about your symptoms in the same way that if you thought you had strep throat you would go in and you'd give all the details of um, I think being willing to be vulnerable about mental health. It just feels different, I think, disclosing that kind of information. Um, But telling your provider if you're, um, again, I I go back to the functioning of like my, I'm experiencing anxiety and I I just can't get out and spend time with my friends like I used to, or um, I'm just having a really hard time getting out of bed. I feel like I'm crying all the time. Um, Whatever those symptoms are, your primary care doctor, should be trained to then dig in and start asking you more questions and um you know their their primary role would be in in medication management and so that would be a a good question to ask what are the medication options for this Um, and you can ask them if they're aware of other options they may have um, kind of go-to referral sources for mental health as well of um, providers that they recommend or that take similar insurance because they're familiar with Um, They know if you're being treated at their clinic that it might be likely that you are able to get in somewhere else. So if people want to make an appointment at one of your locations, how do they do that? So I'd recommend checking out our websites, telehealthcounseling.org. And um, even if you're not interested in an appointment, there's lots of information about our program and our training program and the research that we've done. Um, But for there's a um, link there that shows where all of our access points are. Um, It's one phone number though, so um, folks can call directly 979-436-0700 and say that they're interested in counseling services and we do a screening process to make sure they're a good fit um, and then they get them set up for an appointment with a counselor. And at this time, our services aren't available across Texas. I know we kind of talked about the the vision is that this is, uh, you know, now we have this capability to log in from any mobile device, um, but we do have limitations on the um, services and the service region. Mm -hmm. Um, So definitely check out the website to make sure you're in the service region. Thank you so much, Dr. McCord, for coming out and talking about this issue. Um, We are going to link to all of the resources that you mentioned in our show notes everybody. These services are available. If you're feeling like you need it, please seek help. Yeah. And if, even if not from us, there is, I don't, I don't want to paint such a um, horrible picture of, of the shortage areas. The, the point in sharing that information, one is so that we, you know, increase energy around this. But if, if you are someone that's um, not feeling well and wants to see somebody start now the options may be limited but the the state of texas has divided the region um, and has local mental health authorities that cover the entire state so there and and there's um, you know suicide crisis hotlines um, for our we can put this information in the links to um, one specific to veterans um, spanish speaking there's text only suicide lines Um, So if you're in crisis, please reach out. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for covering this topic. It was great to spend time with you today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to The Vantage Point. We will talk to you next time. Thank you for joining us on Texas A&M Health Talk, a production of the Texas A&M University Health Science Center. 
visit us on the web at vitalrecord.tamhsc.edu where you'll find answers to all of your health questions. Until next time, stay healthy.